Hello and welcome to Graduate Theory. On today's episode, we'll hear about personal branding and the importance of that as we go into careers in 2022. We'll talk about corporate versus startups and what are the pros and cons of working in an established corporate company versus working in a startup. We also talk about getting jobs without permission. And these are really, really exciting concepts. I'm so, so excited for this episode. It's one of the best on graduate theory. So please enjoy. Hello and welcome to Graduate Theory. My guest today is a computer science and marketing graduate from the University of New South Wales. He's worked in marketing, consulting, design, sales and operations at companies like Amazon, Uber, Deloitte, IBM, as well as a few startups. He is currently a product manager at Atlassian. On the side of all this, he is a co-founder and the chief meme officer at Early Work, which now has an audience of over two and a half thousand people. It's been featured by the AFR Startup Daily and Smart Company. He's part of the angel investing program at Airtree Ventures. He's an angel investor himself and advisor at 98, which is a cross-continent Gen Z marketing agency. Please welcome to the show, Dan Brockwell. James, man, thank you so much. I think we're going to have some fun today. Absolutely. I'm, I'm fired up. This is going to be fantastic, I think. There's, there's so much I want to just discuss with you, Dan. And the first question I want to ask is around, you know, personal brand in 2022. And I think this is kind of something that's evolving and changing all the time. You know, how important do you think it is to have an online personal brand in 2022? Yeah, super good question. I think kind of like two just kind of modifying questions there. It's like personal brand for whom? Like, as in, are you a startup founder? Are you a job seeker? Are you an investor? And then, yeah, like, what do you want to use that personal brand for? As in, you could have around very different parts of your life. It could be career related. It could be not career related at all. You might be a musician on the side, an artist, etc. What I would say is that, like, you know, it's only so recently in human history that you can, you know, write something and then that can get seen pretty easily by millions of people. You write something once that scales so easily. And I think having an online personal brand just allows you to get your story out to people in a much more scalable way. It's like you do the work once and then so many people find out about who you are. And you know, there's that old expression, like it's not what you know, it's who you know. The modifying factor there is actually, it's who knows you. And the even further modification is it's who knows you for what. And so I, I'd say like, you know, having an online personal brand is really just like taking extra shots on goal, right? It, it's like, you know, you could be a striker in soccer. You might be a really shitty striker, Having an online personal brand just means more people are going to find out about what you're doing. And just, you know, with with enough shots, you yeah. get some goals. Yeah, I, I love what you said there. And I think it's 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 important to, to like, it's, it's a great idea that, in, you know, today's world, the online technology and things like that, you know, the marginal cost of production, <laughs> you know, or, or how you, however you want to describe it. So, like, you know, giving your newsletter to one extra person, the cost of doing that is, is literally zero. So, you know, the ability for your newsletter to go to 10 people is the same as it is a, a thousand, a million. You know, and and so like being able to scale that and really your personal brand, there's no limit to how many people that you can reach. I think it's hundred percent, hundred percent. I think like yeah, and I think following up even further on that point of scalability, I know Naval Ravikant from who's like the founder of Angel List, kind of which is like a tech careers job site. I think he talks a lot about code and media as those two super scalable things, where it's like number one, you can write code and that software scales to millions. Number two, you can you know create content and that can scale to millions. I think probably like the, the third example there, which has been around for quite a while, is you know you write laws once and those can affect millions of people for a long, long period of time. But compared to content and code, there's a lot more permission and, and a lot more hierarchy in order to affect change in the law. Whereas I think today what you're starting to see is like young people just creating careers online, you know, writing content, building software, and they don't have to wait for anyone to give them permission to do so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really powerful. And... Like, how would you, like, if you were going to start, you, you've got a pretty decent personal brand. I mean, what, how would you go about starting it again today? Is there any avenues or topics or how do you even decide what to speak about and, and where to put it and things like that? So what to, so yeah, content and context. So what to speak about and where to put it, right? Like, I think content, yeah, I mean, the only thing I, I look back, I don't have regrets, but like, I, I wish I'd started earlier as in like talking about like the things that I was learning as like, you know, a young person who just entered the tech and startup world in first year, like my first role in uni proper role was kind of like a startup role. So I think like 
would like documenting my journey early on would have been super super fun just to like share with other friends who were like in uni and maybe they didn't even know about that sort of world i think like the beautiful thing is like you know you can be young you can be pretty inexperienced but you're still going to know more about some things than a lot of people like everyone in life has their own unique journey and so you don't have to be like you know world number one but you might know about something a lot more than most of your friends for instance i mean you might be able to tell your friends about you know how to run a podcast you could literally start running content around that right i think in terms mm -hmm. of context i think and this is something i haven't explored as much yet but i, I think like one thing I would have been keen to experiment with more and will be experimenting with very actively is video content. Like I, I think I, you know, biased pretty heavily towards text because like, I, I think like the, the value for money is really good, so to speak. Like you don't, there's not that much kind of like effort in terms of production beyond kind of just the core writing, but you can scale that to a lot of mm -hmm. people. I think the video is a really deep and rich format. It, it's very engaging. It's very human. And so I, I think, yeah, definitely an opportunity there that I'll be exploring with early work, early talk on TikTok, stay tuned. But yeah, I think like for, for someone yeah. <laughs> starting out, like more generally in terms of like what content to choose, just getting specifically to that question, choose things that interest you, like things that you're just learning about anyway. Like all of us, you know, most people in their spare time often reading about things anyway. They often have little side hobbies and passions and just things that they're fascinated by. And I think the best content comes when it's something that you're approaching with a genuine and authentic curiosity. I, I think coupling that with also then, what are you experiencing that some other people might not be experiencing? So maybe like, you know, like podcast creation tips, for instance, but kind of the intersection of those, like what are your unique experiences or experiences that maybe fewer people have? And then what are the things you're just very naturally drawn to and very curious about? Trying to find the intersection of those, I think is magic. And I think ultimately like, I and I don't, yeah, I, I have a certain perspective on content here, but I, I love the idea of content as a tool like what I'd be thinking about is like, okay, if you're going to go and create something and put it out and give it to other people, what's the, what's the need that you're solving for them? What's the problem that you're solving for them? Like, I love this idea of you know, content as being very actionable. It's like someone should be able to like read a newsletter or listen to a podcast and they can actually apply that sort of thinking very directly in their life in the next week. So in any content that you create, like maybe it starts with just solving a problem for you. And then over time you realize other people have that problem too. Yeah, well, yeah, I, th I think it's so powerful. I totally agree with you in, in today's day and age. And, and yeah, it was interesting what you were saying about, about video as well. Because I think, you know, like a, being across all the different media landscapes can be can be tricky. But, you know, like the video is, is something that, yeah, is, is, is super cool. And even, even TikTok, I think you might have seen it has like more views than Google, I think. Yeah, last more, year, which is more mobile searches. Amazing <laughs> and incredible. Yeah, yeah, more yeah. mobile search. It's yeah, just crazy. Yeah, it's fascinating how something like that has really, yeah, grown so much. For sure. Like, what would be the next step then from taking? So let's say you know you've 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 started like your personal brand. You know you you maybe you've got your Substack or you've got your Twitter or whatever it is. What's like, you know, what's the next step from there? I mean, I guess it depends on why you've started to make it. But let's say mm. you know you've started to kind of market yourself and. You know, you're getting, you're trying to get opportunities. I mean, how do you? I wonder if you have any ex, any experience with that sort of converting this brand into opportunities. I mean, how do you how do you sort yeah. of go about doing that? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, like, I always had the thesis with early work of like building the customer before building the product. If you're building a brand, whether that's a personal brand, whether it's around a topic, with that comes an audience. And if you're curating an audience of a certain niche with a certain interest, as that audience grows, over time, that audience becomes valuable to each other. So the community aspect and then valuable to others as well. And, and so what I would think about is like over time, like mm -hmm. as you build a personal brand and you build a larger audience, think about like, what does that audience have in common? What are kind of the common problems that they have? And then what can you do to provide solutions to those problems? So early work, for instance, started out as a Substack newsletter. So I started off, in September of 2020, curating a list of tech and startup internships and graduate roles for 10 friends, just based around Sydney. Over time, I built that out to me, it was maybe you know 600 subscribers at the time or getting close to a thousand. And I decided to launch a community based around that newsletter along with my co-founders, John and Marina. And I think kind of really the thinking there is, okay, you start with this content, it's getting some traction, people are liking it, reading it. We had a, a small LinkedIn group of power users who we'd white gloved who would give us feedback and suggestions. But the thing I started to see was, wow, there's really not a strong social fabric for young people in Australia who are interested in the, the tech and startup space. And so the next evolution of that initial content became 
a community around that content. And then you start to deepen your content from a one-way conversation where, you know, we're just putting out information for free to a two-way conversation where we're talking with our audience, they're talking with us and talking with each other. And you start to build this richer community. Yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. And it's, it's, yeah, it's a great example of, you know, converting that, that community or, you know, that thing that you had into a community and into something real. I think that was a great point about, you know, solving a problem for your audience. Because, you know, I guess once you hit that sort of critical mass size, there becomes those commonalities where, okay, you know, most people have this problem or most people want this, like, from me or those kinds of things. And it becomes more clear on how to actually solve those problems for them. Oh, yeah. for sure. For sure. I mean, look, if you started a newsletter about tricycles and you got to 10,000 subscribers and, you know, you had 40% of your audience opening it every week, I guarantee you that a tricycle company would love to do a sponsored placement in your newsletter. You could get some great tricycle sponsorships. Now, that's not the number one problem space that I'm focused on. But the, the mm-hmm. point there is it's like if you build anyone, <laughs> uh, you build an audience of anyone with kind of a strong interest in just kind of a certain niche or a certain area, there will be people on the other side of that interest who can provide things to them. And so it's about like, how do you kind of connect people together where there's a kind of a coincidence of once where, you know, one party wants one thing, one party wants the other thing. And by building and curating this audience, you can create like a, a beautiful system that helps those people get what they need. Mm. Yeah, it's really powerful. And uh, yeah, I love what you're doing with early work, you know, with this, with this theme, because it's something that when I first heard about it, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like all these people that, you know, think similarly to me, like for the longest time, even like from like high school through uni, it was like, you know, I'm sure my experience isn't one that I've just had. I'm sure there's many people that have experienced it too, but you know, you're just going out there trying to work out where are the people that are like doing cool stuff and like, (laughs) you know, wanting to like make a stamp on the world and, you know, do interesting things. And, you know, it's really amazing how you've just kind of managed to find all of them (laughs) or like at least, you know, at least two and a half thousand of them (laughs) and, you know, put them into one place. I think it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. But I want to, I want to speak more about the startup scene in Australia and things like that and typically like when you're at university you know a lot of people would have the goal of you know I'm gonna get a good good grades and you know get a good job and go into a successful big company I mean what would you say to someone that's considering that path you know and whereas perhaps startups would be something that might be better or you know what would you say to someone that's really is or on the fence might be better yeah okay <laughs> It, it, this is an interesting one around like kind of like, you know, when your first job out of uni, let's say you've had a couple internships and you kind of go, okay, first full-time job, corporate or stuff. And I, I think like, you know, it's, I don't want to be prescriptive because I don't think the answer is going to be the same for everyone. What I can do as someone who, you know, worked in startups, then in corporate, then back to startups, then back to corporate again, and now building a startup uh, is try and shed some light on the mm. patterns that I've noticed between the two. So when you look at, let's, let's talk about startups. For instance, like let, let's first say, okay, why why would you go to a startup instead of a big established company? Number one, I think is like there's a a breadth of learning. I think you know the smaller the company, the broader your role. Like you're expected to wear many hats, and I think when you're young, you want to just try and explore as many things as possible, and that allows you to think about problems more holistically. So you know, I remember you know doing a role at Offload, awesome logistics startup where I was doing you know recruiting, market research, customer success graphic design, copywriting, email marketing, analytics, legal work, like just about everything under the title operations. And, uh, you know, I swear operations can be just about anything. Mm. So I'd say that breadth of learning, big advantage for startups, right? As a general rule of thumb. Number two, I'd say as well Mm. with startups, and this is a big one that gets talked about, is velocity. Like startups tend to work more quickly. There's less approval systems. There's less layers of hierarchy. What that means is you can create things more quickly, release things to customers more quickly, and learn more quickly. And I think when you're a young graduate, velocity of learning is extremely, extremely important. So being in a fast paced team allows you to you know, create more things, learn more things and grow more quickly. I'd say another thing that I really liked about, you know, kind of like my time in startups is just the very high autonomy and ownership. I, I, I say on average, it tends to be higher in startups than big companies. And there are always exceptions to the rule. But I'd say in startups, like, you know, you might be a junior mm-hmm. person and you might be owning just the entire marketing function. And, and with when you have a lot of autonomy and ownership, it actually gives you a lot of room to experiment to fuck up and learn from that and i think that's really useful too it's not always just about the wins so definitely an advantage from startups there i think probably like yeah final one maybe there's two more like i think there's a piece definitely around the problem space i'd say that by and large startups are more likely not always more likely to be working on problems that are kind of genuinely unsolved 
versus iterating on things that have already kind of like found a solution, found a strong customer, and, and they're kind of just tweaking. I like at least for me as an individual, like yeah, working on solve problems is a ton of fun, and I think that's mm. more common, but not always a guarantee in startups. Final final call out there is maybe just from like a if we're talking like the salary perspective, important to call out like with a lot of startups, you get equity in the startup. And, and not every startup becomes an Uber, but there is kind of that skin of the game of like you own a piece of this business and like by succeeding and growing it, you succeed in growing your own holding. And if there's you know, an IPO or an exit, potentially down the line that there's an amazing opportunity there. But I think with early stage startups, it's, it's very hard to tell exactly how, how legit that's going to be. That's so that, that's the startup side of things, right? So lo- lots yeah. of advantages there. I had a ton of fun startups. I love startups. There are, however, some advantages that you will see in big companies and, and what I want what I hope that people do is like think about these advantages and understand for them what makes sense in in their career and where they're at. I'd say like on the like you know working for like say like a big tech company for instance like number one brand equity Br- brand is used as a heuristic or surrogate indicator of your competence like it or not. And I don't think people should spend their lives working for big brands just to show everyone hey look I work for big brands. But when you're young and just starting out, getting that stamp like that seal of approval, like, you know, oh, you worked at Google, oh, you worked at Facebook. People n- know that you're at like a certain caliber because number one, you got through that interview process. And number two, you got trained up in the ways those companies work. Like big companies have been around so long and got to that point, they must've done something right. So by being there, you're kind of soaking up the processes. And I know I- I've soaked up a ton of like great tools from Atlassian, from Uber, from Amazon. Each of them has done certain things really, really well that allowed them, them to succeed. Whereas most other companies didn't get that far. The caveat there is that you can get brand equity through internships. So you could do, you know, internships at these big companies, but that doesn't mean, and if you've done that, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go and then do a graduate role on those companies. It's kind of a different consideration, but something to think about, right? And I, th- I think number two, mm-hmm. and this is kind of a big one that I hear from, you know, young people, it's like, you know, oh, I want to learn a lot starting off, you know, I- I'm just still early in my career. I don't know much is big companies as a rule of thumb tend to have more structured learning and mentorship. You know, at last I'm very lucky. I've got a buddy, I've got um, a mentor, there's kind of like an APM kind of kind of like program guide as well, who kind of like helps us out, got a manager. And so there's lots of people there to support you. And we'll have, say, like, for instance, like sessions with senior product leaders or like founders of startups outside the company. So there's a lot of events that are happening within the company that allow you to learn lots of like as well, like asynchronous, like video courses you can do through the company. So I'd say in general, bigger companies tend to be stronger on like, okay, they've taking the time to build up build up that library and talent pool of, of structured learning and resources. That being said, some small companies, like I, I've worked at startups where, you know, I got to work directly with the founders and got a lot of mentorship from them. So I, I would want to challenge like, you know, that structured learning. I think structure maybe is a little bit overrated. I think the mentorship is what's really important. But I think a lot of young people can, if we given the right tools mm-hmm. and resources, can go and learn themselves. Um, but yeah, general pattern I've seen. I'd say like kind of maybe to that point, like around like, mentorship opportunities there's just kind of a really big strength there when in big companies you're joining a talent pool of so many smart young people where those people might be your investors down the line they might be your co-founders they might be your employees they might be your future boss um joining a company like atlassian like there are so many amazing product managers at this company like people i'm learning from people i get to chat to see how they work see how they think so you get to soak up a lot of really interesting learning there just by being in a large talent pool of really smart people i think as well like Mm. you know the, the, the flip side to kind of the startups of like, oh, you know, working on unsolved problems, high ownership, high autonomy in big companies, you can work on a product that's literally being used by millions. You know, if you think of, imagine someone who's working on Google Maps, for instance, like that's a product that would be used you know by millions, if not you know, a billion people. So being able to, you know, again, write code once and have that change, you know, that I suppose kind of task in someone's life you know for millions of people is, you know, it, it's a pretty cool and pretty attractive factor. And startups take a lot of time to get to that scale. So there is an immediate scale of impact that you do get. And, and then I think talking more to kind of like the career safety, finally, I think kind of the, the two elements there. Number one tends to be higher salary. Realistically, most startups, early stage startups tend to have like a little bit lower salary. Growth stage can actually sometimes be competitive with the big tech companies, but usually the mature tech companies, like they, they do a lot to try and keep you there. You know, they're making a lot of money. They're public, usually publicly listed big companies and they've done, and because they're building software, you know, the marginal cost of selling it to customers is very low. So very lucrative business model, they can afford to pay some pretty high salaries. The other thing there from a career risk perspective is just, I suppose, safety. And I, I, I want to be very careful here. When I say safety, I don't mean career safety. I purely mean job safety. I purely mean like if you join a big company like an Atlassian, an Amazon, a Google, the chance that you're 
the job just goes poof and gets made redundant is less likely. If you join a startup, you know, it could crash and burn in six months, a year, a year and a half. But I want to decouple that job risk from career risk. Like I think even joining a place where, okay, maybe it's going to go under in a year or two, not necessarily bad for your career. In fact, it'd be very good for your career. Like you're working on very high responsibility things. You're going to be learning super, super quickly, get a lot of responsibility, deliver a lot of like really measurable impact. But yeah, like I suppose like for someone who's a, like, if you're in a very tricky financial situation, then, you know, joining a big company, like, you know, maybe the safer option. That was a massive rant, but yeah, that's kind of just like rattling off a list of like different considerations. <laughs> At the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, the problems you want to work on, the skills you want to cultivate, the environment you want to be in and your career goals. Yeah. No, I thought that was like a fantastic and very well balanced view of these two different areas. I think it's, I think, yeah, I, th I think, you know, in my experience with early work and as I slowly learn more about the Australian startup ecosystem is that, you know, it's some of the startups are probably like undervalued in terms of the, the good experiences that you can have there. And most people just kind of go straight towards big secure companies when, you know, there can be really great experiences that can be found in, you know, smaller startups. And I think, yeah, you raised some really great points there. hundred percent. I think, and it really should call out there as well. And this is a factor that a lot of people don't consider. People go like, oh, you know, I want to go to, you know, a Google or Microsoft because I want to learn from like really experienced people with really good skills. What people forget is that those people don't always stay at those companies. They often go and join startups. So if you were to go to a startup like Eucalyptus or Dovetail, for instance, you're getting mentored by a lot of talent that's come from these big companies. It's almost like the like the, the sweet spot. It's like you're working in a very fast paced environment with very high ownership, but you're still getting mentorship from people who've come from these like, you know, really big, impressive companies. And so they've learned a lot of the skills and processes there. So th there is there is a, an argument to be made that like, you know, that's actually like a, a really good like kind of starting option that like growth phase or breakout phase startup where you're interacting with a lot of talent from top companies anyway. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. And I, I want to ask something too about your own experience because I know you kind of started off and you've interned at a lot of these larger companies and then you kind of went and, and started working at startups. Was What was your thought process behind that because i know there's a lot of people listening are in you know large corporate almost you know the, the safe positions and then going to a startup can be something that's quite you know it can seem quite risky and mm. you know is, is are things going to work out and all these kinds of things i mean what's your thought process in doing things like that and i know have you seen other people that have done stuff like that and and you know what was perhaps their process in doing stuff like that as well yeah, to, in terms of like like what what kind of gives you kind of that emotional safety to kind of take a leap into the startup world. I mean, I, I got lucky because my first role in uni was yeah. with a startup. It just kind of came from like a cold email, joined an ambassador program, ended up working for this startup. Two months in, we got acquired by Airbnb and I lost my job. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. Let's do it again and join another startup. So I had these internships pretty early on. I think like when you're young, like I, I think particularly for people who are like spending a lot of time thinking about their careers and kind of like going the extra mile doing side hustles that sort of stuff like you're already gonna be so far ahead of the pack in terms of your level of effort and care towards your career in, in deciding like let's say you're working in a big company uh and you're deciding oh do i go and join a startup i mean like for me like i'd, I'd be thinking about what problems do i really care about like what like what are the most important problems i want to work on like what just really excites me what would like you know i would be on the weekends just having breakfast bit like thinking about how cool this problem is so if you're going to join a startup like don't just join it because like oh you think oh maybe it'll become big and i'll get a lot of money i think you know startups aren't easy they can be hard sometimes the hours are good sometimes the hours are long very variant depending on the startup so i don't want to make a generalization there but I'd be thinking about, yeah, like what are the problems you want to solve um, and like who in the Australian landscape is actually solving those problems. So you can look at some of, some of like the top venture capital firms. So you look at like, you know, kind of your Blackbird, Airtree, SquarePeg, Folklore, look at the companies that they're investing in and then have a look at, okay, what are those companies doing? And then find the ones in the, the problem spaces that you care about. That for me is like such a huge consideration. I think as well, so that, like, that's kind of like, yeah, probably like the impact side. Then there's more the learning side of like, okay, going into a startup role, maybe i'll make a big impact really cool problem space but then you've got the learning of like okay like what am i going to learn and how fast am i going to learn so the velocity of learning and the type of learning it's like do you want to be cultivating technical skills do you want to be doing design stuff do you want to get like a very broad based strategic approach is it like product management like being intentional about the sort of skills you want to pick up and like going okay if i join this environment am i going to learn those things quickly 
It's another kind of key consideration. So kind of you've got yeah, learning, you've got impact. And I think the final thing, and this is so important, is the camaraderie. It's like, you know, when you look at the team, you look at the culture, you look at the manager, are these people that you want to spend a lot of time with? Are these people that you want to be more like? Like if you're surrounded by those people day in, day out, you're going to become more like those people. And so I think if you're considering, you know, leaving a big corporate join a startup, like you should be joining, you know, a great team, tackling a market that you really care about with a product that you think generally has a shot at solving the the problem in, in a nuanced and differentiated way. Yeah, that was really great. And those are some great questions to ask when you're going through this process or even just thinking about it. Because, I, yeah, I think asking the right questions in these situations is, is really, really important in, you know, getting good answers, even for yourself. Like, you know, things like I've had guests on the podcast before, you know, trusting your gut in these decisions as well can be really, really useful. Like if you're if you're not being fulfilled in a company or the place you're at, you know, that's your almost call to action to go and, and investigate these types of opportunities, I think. For sure. It's so true. And it's actually something I really struggled with throughout uni was actually like on that point of like trusting gut, right? Like there were times where it's like I got a job offer and I would try to write down this really extensive pros and cons list of like, oh, like this is a good opportunity because X, Y, Z, but it's a bad opportunity because X, Y, Z. And like internally like an emotional level i think i knew like oh you know i don't really want this role but i would get an opportunity like oh should i do it and then go through this like ridiculous extensive analysis talk to like 20 people like analysis paralysis i'm an an overanalyzer by nature but yeah there is this fascinating lesson of like Mm -hmm. learning when to trust the gut i think you should always go and collect data so talk to people who are in positions that you want to be you know more like go go like go collect information and advice from a variety but place higher weighting on the people who are doing the sort of things you're actually interested in and the positions you want to be in and then you kind of come back to kind of like your values what you really care about gut feeling and usually you'll have the right answer within yeah i think i think that's important and i think that's really great as well like you know don't just trust your gut with no information <laughs> like that's yeah that's oh, go, go and get the still information that and still make it make an important it, choice exactly like you might go and collect the information mm. and then reject most of it that might be the outcome but you did the due diligence of collecting that information and that's useful because we all have our own blind spots we all have our own biases. We're all just dumb sometimes. So it's it's always good to get a second opinion. Like there's been so many decisions mm. like where it's like my gut was like, oh, just go and do this. And then I talk to people and like, what are you doing? I'm like, true, true. Had to think that one through a bit more. But yeah, no, get advice, but you don't have to listen to all of it. <laughs> yeah, no, true. And, and just on that, on that, and you mentioned it right at the start of your last answer was around you reached out to this company cold and you got a job there and this is a topic that i really want to speak more about because it's something that like almost everyone doesn't do this and like people that i now speak to who who work places they're like yeah this is actually kind of a good idea just reaching out to people cold or like just meeting people that work at the company you want to work at and i'm curious about your experience doing this kind of thing that's not sort of the traditional way of getting a job like you're not waiting for the company to list a job <laughs> you know to, to then apply and you know kind of go go in and try and you know get the job past like you know 50 hundred thousands of other people you know mm. you're, you're sort of going in as, as, like really sort of putting more eggs in their basket and connecting with people that work there and things like that i'd love to hear you know your experience with that and even your process that that you've done and maybe there's other people that you know that have done a similar similar thing yeah i'm really interested to hear your thoughts on all that yeah absolutely it's just crazy like job listings are the tip of the the iceberg of the job market like people see these little things and go okay i'll apply for those and they hope sit and hope for the best but in reality if you think about startups they're always growing they're always raising money they're always hiring and so many things just happen through referrals or ad hoc introductions or all these hidden job opportunities and it's like if you want to work at a startup, like startups by their nature, like proactive people. And so the best thing you can do is be proactive. Don't wait for the job listing, make the job listing. And yeah, ha- happy to talk through kind of my experiences here. So I suppose like I, I worked for three different startups in university. One kind of initially came when I was, the first one was a startup called Tilt, social payment startup and my first internship. And originally I was conceptualizing an app with friends called Friends with Deficits. And we were trying to like track debts between friends of different currencies, did some competitor research, found this company called Tilt. I was like, damn, they've solved it. Oh, but they have an ambassador group at UNSW. So I emailed the country manager in Australia. I was like, hey, I'd love to join the ambassador group. He's like, yeah, sure, man. Open up applications, join that ambassador group, did that for a couple months. And then that converted into a growth internship with them leading an ambassador program of a couple hundred students across Australia. So a ton of fun there. 
But I think kind of that came from, yeah, number one, the proactive reach out, so cold email. And then number two, being part of something related to the company before actually having the role. So an ambassador program is a great example, but it might be like, you know, maybe there's like an, a beta testers group. Maybe it's doing user research for the company. Or maybe it's, you know, helping promote the company or something. There are ways that you can kind of get affiliated with the company without actually formally being a part of it. The kind of internship number two was a fascinating one where there's a restaurant ordering startup called Table, kind of essentially kind of like, you know, me and you or Mr. Yum, where you could kind of like order on your mobile in your in the restaurant and then wait for a waiter. This one, I saw ads running for the startup on Facebook. I was like, and it was for a referral competition. They hadn't launched yet. I'm like, oh, this is super cool. I spammed it across a bunch of university discussion groups, got to like top 10 in referrals in like 24 hours or something. And then I reached out to the chief operating <laughs> officer or chief executive officer on LinkedIn. I was like, hey dude, like, yeah, love the problem you're working on. Super, super fascinating. I'm actually interning at a startup right now, but saw your thing. And I was like, oh, I'm just gonna share this with like a bunch of people ended up getting to this referral position at this time. If you're open to bringing on a marketing intern, let's have a chat. Ended up meeting them at Westfield in Bonner Junction, one meeting and then work for them for like six months. So that, I, I think that came from, there, there are two things there. Number wow. one, cold LinkedIn DMs, are just amazing. And with cold LinkedIn DMs, like the key thing is like who, why, what? Who are you? Why are you reaching out? And what's in it for them? So explain like who you are and maybe like you're a student ma majoring in this, interning at this place why you're reaching out you came across them and really liked X, Y, Z about them and what's in it for them? Are you open to taking on an intern? Not are you currently hiring an intern or currently seeking, but just say you open because no one wants to be closed. People might not have a job listing. And then you go, hey, you open to an intern and they're like, uh, oh yeah, maybe, let's have a chat. So it's, it's a good way to get, kind of get your foot in the door. And the other thing there is like adding value before you've even reached out. So I reached out after I'd gone and shared their app with a bunch of people and that shows that proactivity where a startup goes, oh, cool. Okay, if we hire this person, we know we're not gonna have to wait to give them instructions. They're just gonna go and do things that help the company. So there's a cool piece there. Final one is an interesting one. There was a job listing, but it wasn't an internship. It was at a company called Offload, awesome like uh, road freight logistics startup in Australia. And they had a listing for a full-time operations associate. I was working at Amazon all the time, so I'd been deepening my interest in logistics, but I wanted to kind of go and back, hop back into the startup world. And I had seen this listing and I went, Mm, well, I can't do full-time, but I could do part-time. So I just applied and then I just messaged the, the chief operating officer. I went like, hey man, like, yeah, love what you're working on. I've got, you know, background at like Amazon and Uber. So passionate about logistics space. Context is, you know, I I'm still wrapping up at uni, but would you be open to, you know, taking on someone part-time? And, you know, had several interviews with the team and eventually like, yep, sweet. And so that was meant to be a full-time role, but turned it into a part-time role. I ended up going full-time there. So I worked there for probably six months. It was my last role before it lasted. Absolutely loved it there. Really the lesson is like, sometimes a job description will tell you roughly what they want, but they're flexible. So sometimes I might say two plus years experience, apply anyway. Sometimes I might say full-time. If you want to do part-time, apply anyway. It's don't sell yourself out of the opportunity, have the conversation. And if they like you, they'll make space for you. If it's not the right fit, it's not the right fit, and that's okay. Some people go, you know what, sorry, you know, we need someone full time. And that's totally fine. It's not a not a personal insult. But I think with a sufficient number of companies that you talk to, these opportunities will start to pop up where you can create job opportunities where you thought previously job opportunities didn't mm. exist. I think kind of like wrapping that up, yeah. I think look, cold LinkedIn DMs to like founders and hiring managers at startups, super, super powerful. But I'd say as well on the kind of like standing out to company side beyond just kind of like doing like DMs on like LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. Another cool thing you could do is like sending like a video resume or a video pitch to stand out for other candidates. So I've seen some candidates record like Loom videos before, which is super, super cool. And it gives that real personal flavor. Obviously you can go and refer mm. people. You can, and a really cheeky piece is like, you can actually give them like feedback on their app. Like you could say, hey, I actually went through and redesigned your website or I went through and like rewrote the copy of your website. So being proactive and be like, here's what I would do to improve it. And just sending that to them and just seeing what happens. It's very low risk. I, I think in general, yeah, um, giving feedback on the product or writing about the company, like writing an article about, like you could write an article on, oh, like, you know, how eucalyptus has grown to become, you know, a billion dollar company by using Instagram marketing or something. I don't know if they're quite a unicorn yet. You'll have to fact check me on that one. But yeah, the, the point is that I think there are so many ways <laughs> to proactively stand out that are not a resume and that are, are not a cover letter. Like... If you want to stand out and you want to be in a job pool of one and not a 500, do something different. Yeah, that's so important. 
so important and I think you know even like something like a personal brand like we spoke earlier you know things like that combined with all this like yeah it's it's really really powerful when you're going to apply for jobs like this Uh, for sure and and I think also like I mean coming back to that personal brand thread it's really interesting because I think having a personal brand online just creates luck like I've gotten lucky many many times in my life and I think a lot of my career success is almost just down to luck but I do think that having a personal brand like amplifies your luck just more lucky opportunities come up for instance like I was pretty active on LinkedIn. I was one of those cringe, you know, LinkedIn memes for career-minded teens type of people. And I would like make posts on LinkedIn and stuff. And I won some <laughs> award in like the business consulting space, made a post about it. And actually ended up getting a message from a guy who was working at Google. And he's like, hey, like, love your profile. Would you be interested in an internship at Google? I was like, oh, sweet. And now this guy um, ended up moving to Uber, I think a couple months later, like we kind of lost touch and then reconnected. And he's like, hey, actually I'm now at Uber, but we're bringing on like interns and like we've got like one spot left. Would you be interested? And I was like, yeah, sure. That's awesome. And end up getting an internship at Uber in sales purely from just someone who had seen my content on LinkedIn. So that's what I'm saying. Like, is it like having the personal brand? It's yeah, not who you know, it's who knows you and for what. They just encounter your your content and that's kind of like the initial funnel into, okay, then opportunities with you. It's advertising for you pretty much. That's cool. And it's exciting that everyone has this ability too, I think. You know, there's no wall or barrier bet- between you and, you know, doing like, you know, having that story like what you just mentioned, like getting people coming to ask you for jobs. Like, There's absolutely nothing in the way. So, yeah, it's so, so valuable. Yeah, I think that's super important, right? Because uh, like from an equity, diversity, access, inclusion perspective, you know, you look at traditionally like hiring and, you know, more traditional industries like consulting, law and banking, and there's often been a perception of, nepotism or, or like you know oh you have to have friends in the firm or you have to you know, know people at the firm i think the beauty about online content is anyone can do it it's permissionless you don't need to know anyone um you just start creating and if you're creating good stuff and you're creating consistently it'll attract people who care about those things i think the really important thing there then becomes okay how, how do we actually help more young people particularly people from underrepresented and disadvantaged backgrounds actually take advantage of the the power of content creation for their careers because I, I think it just gives you a massive massive advantage yeah totally and and speaking of advantages i want to dive in a little bit more about your you know we've spoken about all these different roles you've had and really you've you've covered so much ground in, in terms of you've done you know marketing consulting sales tech like all these areas you know how do you think that's re- benefited you in in getting to where you are now and having that range of experiences, do you think that's something that's been really valuable in your experience? Oh, it's been mission critical. Like I just like, I, I thank my my younger self for being so like like ADHD and just like, oh, I'm just gonna try everything. Like it seemed a bit like uh, wacky and, and uncoordinated at the time. I think, yeah, I think pretty early on I had a thesis where it's like, okay, I have no idea what the fuck I wanna do. So why don't I just try a lot of different, and I think that helps in two ways. Number one, you uncover things that you do and don't like. Like I tried, you know, sales, marketing, design, operations, project management, front end web dev. And, and so you, you pick up on lots of different skills. You, you test out different things. You get to see the world in different ways. O- ultimately, you'll come to skills you like more. So for me, I think like what I loved most was kind of like product, marketing, sales, content, things that like very much had that human element to them. I think that's what I was always drawn to less so kind of like purely the tech side or the numbers side. But the other really powerful thing, I think like if you want to start your own thing someday, if you're a CEO, CEOs say, and I don't think you should like worship the CEO title, but like if you're starting something, right? Like creating something from scratch, going from zero to one, I think having that generalist skill set is an advantage. And in particular, a holistic problem solving mindset, being able to see a problem for different angles. So it's like when I come to a problem right now with early work or even Atlassian, I'm not just thinking about it from like, a, oh, here's the technical perspective. You know, I'm considering the design because I've worked in design. I'm considering the customer side of marketing because I've worked in marketing. Even the, the sales pitch, I've worked in sales. So when you're young and you're still just early in your career and you're like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, like get a lot of different data points. And the more data you have, the more lenses you have, like all the angles you have of like the same problem. You can just see it from different ways. That actually, I think allows you to come to on average uh, more robust uh, and, and more successful decision making when it comes to solving problems. Yeah, I, I think it's so important too and uh, something I've spoken about on the podcast before is there's a book called Range and it's by David Epstein and he's mm. kind of has this theory that range is like the, the way to go in terms of you know traditional success or having a 
finding the right career and things like that. And that's in contrast to the classic like 10,000 hours rule where it's like, you know, you've, if you want to be good at something, you've got to just do only that for like, <laughs> you know, 10 years or whatever. And, and then like you've said, there's this other way of doing it where it's like, I'm going to have all these experiences in different areas and then one, like somehow I'm going to do something and all these things are just kind of going to interconnect and I'm going to have such an advantage over everyone because I've had all these diverse things that just line up and it just gives me, like you've said, much better perspective and you're able to just look at things in a new way and it's, it's so, so powerful. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one, like the specials versus generals thing because I think there's a the balance here and people talk about, like, you know, the T-shaped model of being, you know, g decent across a lot of things and great at like one or two things. And I think that's broadly the, the model that I'd subscribe to. I've, I've always loved mm. Scott Dilbert. Oh, what's his name? Scott Adams. Sorry. Are you familiar with Scott Adams, the guy who wrote like the, the Dilbert comic? I might be getting his oh, name Scott wrong. Scott Adams, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. I mean, he, 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 is one of the, he is one of the best examples of the talent stack. He's one of the best examples. Scott Adams was, you know, he was a funny guy. He could tell jokes, but he wasn't the world's best comedian. He was a decent artist. He could draw, but he wasn't the world's best, you know, artist. And he worked in kind of like, you know, corporate culture and offices and all that, but like wasn't like the best corporate worker. But the intersection of those three things allowed him to create a really unique intersection. It allowed him to create like a humorous comic about office culture. And so just by being better than average at a several things, he found the intersection of those things and then was able to get a really big win on the board. And so when it comes to being a general, it's like, okay, the range thesis, and, and I haven't read range, so forgive me if I misinterpreted the thesis. I think, like, yes, like, it's great, like, start off early, explore a lot of things, but you'll find some things that you more naturally gravitate towards, or some things that really, in, you really enjoy, some things that really energize you. I think the magic comes from finding, like, the two to three things you're best at, maybe three to four, and thinking about, okay, what's the intersection of those? And when I say best at, it could be a skill, or it could be a knowledge about a certain area. So maybe you've spent a lot of time in the sustainability space, like you've been working on sustainability and maybe you also love making TikToks, right? As in like, you know, you're a very avid user of social media. You're, you're good at like, you know, short form content creation, good at doing funny stuff. You might then create like a sustainability TikTok channel. So it's about like, I always think about intersections, intersections, intersections. Every person has such a beautiful, rich and complex story in their life. And we will all encounter different things and we'll all be great at certain things. And so it's like, how do you just, tap into you know what your your strengths are and combine them into i think what's a unique offering that no one else can do because no one else is you like james you are you're the best at being you james specifically there are other mm. good jameses i don't want to insult them i have, I have several friends named james but i i think it's, <laughs> such, a, it's such a fascinating piece there right i, I think and, and people go like okay so like yeah like I, i'm not sure mm. sometimes people go like oh i'm not sure like what my strengths are i don't know what i'm good at or what i'm bad at there are a couple ways you can do this, right? Yeah, you, know, you can go, okay, like what subjects do you enjoy most in school? What subjects did you do best at in school? But also what were the things when you were a little kid that you were just drawn to? Like things that you found fun or exciting or interesting? Like that childlike self, what, what, what did you just naturally gravitate towards? Trying to kind of reflect on that is really interesting. Like I actually remember, I'm not shitting here, here. I'm not joking. My friend and I in year three, we both wanted to be marketers. <laughs> we're like oh yeah marketing advertising that's like so cool like we saw ads on tv with they're hilarious like it's so creative wow. and like doing really funny stuff and i was like yeah i want to do marketing at yeah. so bizarre and then I, like i ended up doing uni i didn't even start in marketing I, I started off doing like finance and like biology and i ended up in marketing anyway it's like you i almost came back around to the child self it's like i bet i'm so myself i'm like oh wait i actually just love this idea of like how do you like capture the mm -hmm. story of why something is like a valuable solution for someone like that, that paradigm is really fascinating. But I mean, another way to do this is like, you could ask your family and friends, like like if you if you were to ask your five closest friends, hey, like, what do you think like I'm much better at than most people? Or like, what do you, when you think about like, you know, kind of like my skills and my strengths, like what do you what do you associate with that world? You can also ask them for weaknesses too. Definitely do that. That's a good one. Always good to get kind of feedback. But ask your family and friends, like, you know, like, mm -hmm. and what you'll, you'll be surprised, you will see patterns. People will know, oh, James is just like really good at hosting podcasts. I don't know what it is. I, I think that, but yeah, like th there will be, there will be several skills here that will just kind of come up as patterns that like, even if you don't yet have that self-awareness, the world around you will have at least a perceived awareness of your strengths and skills. And so, yeah, I, I think for every young person, you know, when you're trying to work out what the hell to do, it's really powerful to be able to just try and find those early intuitive strengths and inclinations, and then start to think about how to combine them. Massive rant, but yeah, I hope that vibe was vaguely what you're looking for. No, 
<laughs> no, definitely. I think I think you're spot on there in, in working out your strengths, and you know that that Scott Adams, you know, stacking is is a fantastic example, and you know just shows that you know you don't have to be you know the best like you know someone's always going to be better than you at most things so it's just combining those things together and then working out where you can really thrive is is really really cool and you gave yeah great examples there of like finding your your strengths and weaknesses i think is so important to because sometimes it can be hard to know that about yourself when you're just going around about your day and it's so useful to get other people's you know thoughts on you because yeah sometimes you know it's it, it's uh so hard to tell like oh what am i like am i funny like <laughs> am i you know what am i what am i good at kind of thing it's sometimes hard to know that so maybe i'm funny it, yeah it's 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 really cool to to be able to get other people's opinions definitely i think that's really really useful yeah i mean that's with the caveat of like you know other people will give you their opinions but that's not necessarily a reflection of like your energy internally like some things might just energize you and you might just love them and maybe people haven't seen examples of them like you, for instance, okay, you could be someone who's like, you know, like done very well at math mm. in school, but maybe you didn't actually enjoy it. Maybe you just like worked really hard at it. People are like, oh yeah, James, he's like the math guy. But maybe that's not, maybe you actually just love drawing and painting and like maybe you're not as good there yet, but you just have the passion and energy. And to be honest, like I back like the passion and the energy like as like a long-term bet more so than just like, oh yeah, like, you know, like I just happen to get like good grades in this thing. Yeah, I mean, I think usually they tend to coincide. Like usually like the things that you're really passionate about, you just end up tending to do well at because you're just thinking about them a lot it's just the way your brain operates but you know it's not always a one-for-one -one mapping yeah 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 totally well yeah i've got to, i've learned so much through this it's been really really fascinating <laughs> and there's so many takeaways for myself but i do have one more question for you dan Shit. and that is around you know people that are graduating and going into jobs at the start of this year that it's 2022 they're, they're starting out in their career and what is some, some advice that you would give someone starting their career this year oh and if, i mean yeah regardless of whether they're going to a startup or a corporate i i would say optimize for learning like and when i say optimize for learning optimize for the learning that you want if you like, so not just like, oh, okay, here's the structured program at like, you know, your, your company, but like find out the things that you want to learn and your, your priority should be like, how do I learn those things as quickly as possible? You know, how can I practice them? How can I teach them? How can I engage with them? Like maybe you want to become a really good public speaker. Maybe you want to become a really good salesperson, a really good developer. But I, I think like being very intentional about like the way you spend your time and it's not every second of the day. You always need breaks, but like, you know, at work or maybe it's like side projects. Yeah, just just really thinking intentionally about like, what like what am I learning and how fast am I learning it? Having a clear framework and plan there. I, I think probably the, the other piece is as best you can try and find other people who care about similar things to you. Find other people, as in like, I mean, then this, that's a two part one, right? Number one, and th this is an ongoing question in life, but start exploring like, what are, what are the problems that you'd want to work on for like 10 plus years in your career? Like, what are the things you're like, wow, that's crazy. Like maybe it's climate change or like nuclear warfare or, you know, artificial intelligence. There's all these cool areas and, and it takes time, you know, reading, exploring. But I think one of the best things you can do is just talking to other people. Like co-learning is such a beautiful thing. So find people with good values who have really high aptitude, who care about similar problems and are doing something about it. And just try and learn from them, teach each other. Like I, I look back at uni and, and like, you know, there are several friends like, even that I have to this day. And we've actually gone down quite different paths. Friends who went super deep into cryptocurrency, friends who went very deep into the, the law space, friends who went into video game design, friends who were doing, you know, their PhDs. But kind of a common thread there is kind of just like, yeah, like, I think like, like a really strong core set of values that's shared and just a really, really strong curiosity and intentionality to the way they live their lives. And so I think like just, yeah, finding people that you resonate with, like the, the people you surround yourself with will just have a huge, huge outsized impact on how your career progresses one more thing before i forget start creating content now find the things that you care about and just start creating newsletter TikTok, social media posts art whatever it may be it doesn't even matter but when you create content you will find people who care about things similar to you um, and that is just going to be a superpower for years and years to come yeah that is fantastic there's this episode's been fantastic. There's so much value uh, from you today, Dan. So uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Uh, but before we let you go, I just want you to say, you know, where can people find you and where can they connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. So on Twitter, 
at Dan Brockwell, B-R-O-C-K-W-E-L-L. I should post a lot there. Early work, my baby and my love, is <laughs> earlywork.co, C-O, as the website, our newsletter, where we write free career advice and resources on the future of work for young people, earlywork.substack.com, so S-U-B-S-T-A-C-K. That's kind of our newsletter. And like on the earlywork.co website, you can find our Slack community. So we, we have a Slack community of 1,000, oh, maybe 1,800 people now young people across Australia and New Zealand co-learning in their careers across product management, marketing, design, engineering, stuff like crypto, sustainability. We're, we're trying to build the number one community for young people creating the careers of tomorrow. So if you're someone who wants to like, you know, do some really cool shit in your career, create your own things, like make a really positive impact, we'd love to have you in the community. So I'll see you there. Easy. Wait, thanks so much, Dan. Thanks for coming on. We'll, we'll see you soon. Absolute pleasure, James. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode with Dan. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I think there were so many nuggets of wisdom throughout this episode. Uh, If you want to get my takeaways, the three things that I learned from this episode, please go to graduatetheory.com slash subscribe where you can get my takeaways and all the information about each episode straight to your inbox. Thanks so much for listening again today and we're looking forward to seeing you next week.